Welcome everyone to a video on Nietzsche's dictum that God is dead, which we find in Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, The Gay Science, in the third book, in paragraph 125. And before I begin, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and <clears throat> support me on Patreon. I would like to read the entire section of The Madman and provide some commentary. But it's such an important section that I think it's necessary to listen to it a couple of times. Because sometimes what people think is that the that Nietzsche proclaims the death of God as something grandiose, as something wonderful, something that we are, as some modern day contemporary atheists, so that Nietzsche couldn't be further from from those kind of uh, arguments, or those kind of uh, juvenile uh, celebration. Nietzsche was very aware that the death of the Christian God, of the moral hypothesis, etc., comes at a great cost. And the context is extremely important. The section just before Der tolle Mensch, just before the madman, is entitled in the German Im Horizont des Unendlichen, which is in English, in the horizon of the infinite. Now Nietzsche here writes, we have forsaken the land and gone to sea. We have destroyed the bridge behind us. More so, we have demolished the land behind us. Now, little ship, look out. Beside you is the ocean. It is true, it does not always roar and at times it lies there like silk and gold and dreams of goodness. But there will be hours when you realize that it is infinite and that there is nothing more awesome, awe-inspiring, horrible than infinity. In German, the word is furchtbar. And of course, in modern day English, awesome doesn't mean anything anymore. Furchtbar means terrifying. So there's nothing more terrifying than infinity. Think of the ever-expanding multiverses that we live in. Oh, the poor bird, Nietzsche continues, that has felt free and now strikes against the walls of this cage. Woe when homesickness for the land overcomes you as if there had been more freedom there and there is no more land. Now, what Nietzsche is doing here is he's leading up to the madman, to this deep horror of the death of God, to as Laplace said to Laponion, I have no need of that hypothesis in his model of the universe. This is how we killed God. That's the trajectory of this explosion of power, the explosion of knowledge that is modernity through through which we have to stride. So the nihilism that Nietzsche speaks of is very much, has very much to do with the death of God. And Nietzsche is not a nihilist in the sense that he celebrates this, but he is aware that we need to stride through this nihilism and become halcyonic thinkers, those who can hear the sound of another epoch that's already on the horizon if we're able to hear it the halcyonic tone, the sound of the halcyon bird, the halcyon, which is a bird that breeds in winter, knowing that the sea is only still for a couple of weeks. So this little bird is extremely powerful. Der tolle Mensch, the madman. Now I'm reading section 125, but before, just briefly, the Gay Science is the book which ends on, at least um, the fourth book ends on, the eternal recurrence of the same. There's a section in paragraph 341 which is entitled Das größte Schwergewicht, the heaviest weight. And the last section is Incipit Tragödie, where he already mentions Zarathustra. So the eternal recurrence of the same is supposed to give us weight again in the moment when we are again attacked by das Unendliche, the infinite, the that which 
is not ending. The Aperon. Anaximander speaks of the Aperon. It's something that's been attacking the human being forevermore. As finite beings, we're always grappling with the infinite. And the horizon of the infinite, of course, is a bit of uh, an oxymoron, because in the infinite, there is no proper horizon, because there is nothing that limits the infinite. So that what we have to do as finite beings is to find those horizons. Or with Nietzsche, we have to become bridges over men who build bridges to this other epoch where there will be again a horizon, which means such a limitation that meaning can arise again. In Tipit Tragödi, and the eternal recurrence of the same is important for this in, in Nietzsche's thought, because the eternal recurrence of the same is not a thought experiment. It's about understanding that time works in this, as Heidegger would put it, ecstatic way, where <clears throat> what has been comes back in every other moment. So nothing ever fully disappears if we make the moment a highest moment. So there's a, what Nietzsche argues for, if anything, is for a great responsibility of the human being, of, of some human beings, not all human beings for Nietzsche. And the last section of the fourth book of the Gay Science is entitled Incipit Tragedia, Tragedy Begins, because we must again be capable of appreciating tragedy. So we must again be able to appreciate tragedy, because this is, according to Nietzsche, what we have forgotten, for the most part, and you think, remember, the first book he writes is The Birth of Tragedy, the first proper book on the Dionysian and the Apollinian. And the Greeks, what they were capable of, is appreciating the abysses of existence and turning them into highest moments for themselves. Now here we go. Section 125, The Madman. Haven't you heard of that madman who in the bright morning lit a lantern and ran around the marketplace crying incessantly, I'm looking for God. I'm looking for God. And if you live or have been to London six, seven years ago, they put up ads on buses where it said, don't worry, God doesn't exist. Th these are proper madmen, right? Because they're not even worried about anything. Since many of those that they don't hear this terrible cry of a dying God, they're just the last man sinking down into comfortable oblivion enjoying themselves, consuming the next product, the next service, that God can die. That's the horror. Since many of those who did not believe in God were standing around together just then, he caused great laughter. Has he been lost then? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone to sea, emigrated? Thus they shouted and laughed, one interrupting the other. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Where is God? he cried. I'll tell you. We have killed him. You and I, we are all his murderers. But how did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Where is it moving to now? Where are we moving to? Away from all suns? Are we not continually falling? And backwards, sideways, forwards in all directions? Is there still an up and a down? Aren't we straying so through an infinite nothing? Isn't empty space breathing at us? Hasn't it got colder? Isn't night any more night coming again and again? Don't lanterns have to be lit in the morning? Do we still hear nothing of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we still smell nothing of the divine decomposition? 
God's too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How can we console ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? The holiest and the mightiest thing the world has ever possessed has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water could we clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what holy games will we have to invent for ourselves? Is the magnitude of this deed not too great for us? Do we not ourselves have to become gods merely to appear worthy of it? There was never a greater deed. And whoever is born after us will on account of this deed belong to a higher history than all history up to now. Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners. They too were silent and looked at him disconcertedly. Finally, he threw his lantern on the ground so that it broke into pieces and went out. I come too early, he then said. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way. Wandering, it has not yet reached the ears of men. Now this is very important. Think back to what he says up here. Hasn't it got colder? Aren't we straying as though through an infinite nothing? Aren't we straying as though through an infinite nothing? And to anyone who thinks in terms of the meaning crisis or nihilism or a lack of meaning or the sudden death of meaning, or that there's something weird about this epoch, might have the sensation of us straying through an infinite nothing. And this infinite nothing is the ever-expanding now multiverses. And we are trapped in it. Empty space is breathing at us. But little did Nietzsche know that there would be, there would come a year, there would come a time when human beings celebrate a dodgy image of, of a black hole, so-called, as if there were any meaning in a black hole, as if there were anything that it could tell us for what it means to be a finite being attacked by the infinite. Little did he know that perhaps a higher history is not on the horizon yet, because we're not even willing to live up to this fact that if we follow Nietzsche, we have killed God. What we do is, don't worry, God's dead, you should be fine, just get a nice flat screen TV and be the last man and leap on the earth and make it all flat, make it all without niveau. I come too early, the madman says. And he still comes too early, perhaps. My time is not yet. And now this is something where we learn how thinking works, how slowly everything occurs, and how very slowly the sciences catch up to things. This tremendous event is still on its way, wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. And here we think back to Heraclitus, who in the official first fragment, according to Dielskrantz, Heraclitus says that we are always already in a listening or hearing relationship with Logos. But we don't listen to Logos. Hoi puloi, the many don't listen to Logos. There's something about hearing. We don't hear this event yet. We haven't heard its echoes. We haven't heard the echoes of the scream of the void that's now surrounding us, of the infinite bursting open again. And it needs time. The light of stars, he says, needs time. Thoughts come on silent feet. They come quietly, those that move the world. We cannot will anything into being. Nietzsche would have to concede to that here, I think. But we have to respond to such events of which we're not entirely innocent, but of which we are quite obviously not even capable of making sense of them. And it was lightning and thunder the way it happened, the sudden disappearance of God but the event itself, the event of this disappearance, that's taking 
its time and it's taking its time to work its ways through history. But Nietzsche sees at the end of it, if there come a bridge, a higher history, a history higher than ever before. It's about this explosion of power in which we are. And if we respond to it properly, then we can make it our own. Nietzsche continues, lightning and thunder need time. The light of the stars needs time. Deeds need time even after they are done in order to be seen and heard. This deed is still more remote to them than the remotest stars, and yet they have done it themselves. It is still recounted how on the same day the madman forced his way into several churches and there started singing his Requiem Eternam Deo. Grand God, eternal rest, that means. Let out and call to account the madman is said always to have replied nothing but what then are these churches now if not the tombs and sepulchres of God. And that just shows the violence of this thought. If we take it seriously, seriously that God is dead, then the churches are nothing but tombs. They're a grave. They're a grave of God, of a decomposing God. And if that were true, then that would have, shall we say, rather significant meaning for our time. And while then we live amongst tombs, we are also attacked again by the infinite, by the aperon, and we're trying to grapple with it. And this explosion that we see, people talk about the arrival of zero, etc., the most abstract, this explosion of abstraction, acceleration, etc., the multiverse, those are for Nietzsche, they come only with the death of God. And the horizon of the infinite bursts open this tremendous horizon that doesn't properly have a horizon of itself, hence we fail to make sense. And Nietzsche's response to that is the eternal recurrence of the same, together with the will to power, but also together with a striding through this nihilism, knowing that by the law of the Halcyon, of the Halcyon bird, that there is there is a brighter day to come. Right? Nietzsche writes books like Dawn or Morgenröte, the dawn, uh, break of the dawn of the day, break of the day, and the eternal recurrence of the same is supposed to give us weight again, pull us down to not flow, let us float into uh, the, the empty empty space and the void, but to give meaning in the way that if everything recurs in every other moment, then every moment counts and every moment must be made a highest. That's this incredible heavy weight that lies upon us. That's the burden of modern man who lives after the death of God. So these are just some thoughts on on Nietzsche's dictum that God is dead. So thanks very much for listening. And if you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the channel and support me on Patreon. Thanks very much.